Moving now to expense recognition. Expenses are decreases in economic benefit during the accounting period in the form of outflows or depletion of assets or incurrences of liabilities that result in decreases in equity. This is a complicated way of expressing a very simple concept. When you pay rent, then your cash, which is an asset, comes down. So that's uh, expense. When the asset comes down, that means your equity is coming down, assuming the liability is unchanged. Another situation is where your liability goes up. So if asset stays the same and liability goes up, let's take an example. Let's say that your pension obligation is a liability. Over a given period, if the pension obligation is going up, that means your liability is going up. If the asset stays the same, that means that equity must be going down. So simplistically, decreases in assets are expenses and increases in liabilities are expenses because both of these items tend to decrease equity. Matching principle. The matching principle states that expenses to generate revenue are recognized in the same period as revenue. The classic example of this is with inventory and cost of goods sold. Let's say that you purchase inventory in period one, but that inventory is sold in period two. Now, how is this accounted for? In period one, where you actually spend money to buy the inventory, the money that you spend on inventory is not shown as an expense. That is shown as a asset on the balance sheet called inventory. So if you spent 100 on inventory in period one, you create an asset called inventory worth 100. In period two, which is where you actually sell that inventory, that's where the expense is realized in the form of cost of goods sold. So for period two, in the income statement, you will show a cost of goods sold of 100. That is very simplistically the matching principle where the expense that is related to the revenue. You generate revenue by selling that inventory. The revenue is shown in period two, so you want to match the expense of 100 with the revenue that came about because of that expense. There is obviously a lot more to inventory and the curriculum in this particular reading talks about concepts like first in, first out for inventory, last in, first out, weighted average and so on. But I will skip this now because later on there is a reading on inventory that covers this material in a lot of detail. We have a type of cost called period cost or period expenses. These are simply reflected in the period when the expense is incurred. Classic example would be rent cost or electricity related costs where it does not make sense to capitalize those costs. What we did over here was the inventory cost was capitalized. Capitalized means that we create a asset. But if you have a rent cost for period one, it makes no sense to capitalize rent cost. So rent is an example of a period cost that is simply shown as a expense for the period where it happened. Some high level issues in expense recognition that you as a financial analyst need to be aware of. Doubtful accounts. When a company sells on credit, there are going to be some customers who will not return. So in a given period, let's say credit sales worth 100 are made. And based on past experience, you estimate that out of this 100, only 95 will be paid and 5 will be unpaid. So this is your estimate for doubtful 
accounts and this cost or expense of 5 should be shown in the same period where you are showing the revenue of 100. This again is an example of the matching principle. Sometimes you will hear the term provision for doubtful accounts. Provision simply means an estimate. You don't wait for a year or two to find out exactly how much is paid and how much is not paid. You simply come up with a provision or an estimate and apply that in the same period where you recognize the revenue. Again, this is an example of the matching principle. And then later on, there are accounting ways of adjusting based on what actually happens. Another item that you need to be aware of is warranties. Again, let's say that you sell goods worth 100 in period 1 and there is a 3-year warranty. You expect warranty claims to come in over the third year and you expect that warranty claims worth 10 is what will come in over here. That is the cost that you are expecting. The question now is whether that cost should be recognized over here when it actually happens or should you recognize the cost or a provision for the cost in the same period where you sold the items. And the answer is that the provision for warranties should be recognized in the same period where the item is sold. Again, this is an example of the matching principle. Depreciation and amortization. When a company buys long-lived assets such as equipment, it might spend a lot of money. So let's say again 100 is spent on long-lived assets and these assets are expected to last 10 years. Does it make sense to show this entire 100 as an expense when the 100 is actually spent? Or does it make sense to spread this 100 out over a 10 year period because the machine will be used for 10 years? The answer is that it clearly makes sense to spread this 100 over a 10 year period because the machine is being used for that 10 year period. So we are spreading that cost out. Now the issue that comes up is the amount of time over which to spread the cost or the amount of time over which to depreciate is an estimate that a company makes. A company that is very aggressive might say that the machine will go on for a long time so the depreciation expense in each period is relatively low. A company that is conservative might depreciate faster. So the implications for financial analysts are shown over here. As you have seen, for doubtful accounts, warranty expense and depreciation, the company that is coming up with these numbers is using estimates. So these numbers require a lot of judgment. And obviously these numbers impact the overall expense of a company. And the expense will impact the net income. The conservative approach is early recognition of expenses. So a conservative company slightly overestimating the expenses, whereas an aggressive company might err on the side of underestimating these expenses. An analyst should recognize whether a company's expense recognition policy is conservative or not. And this can be determined by reading the footnotes and disclosures. An analyst should recognize that it is quite possible for two companies, even in the same industry, to have slightly different expense recognition policies. So two companies that are similar in all respects might have different expense numbers reported because their accounting policy is different. So that doesn't make one company better than the other. It simply means that they are following different policies. Non-recurring items and non-operating items. Analysts are generally trying to estimate future earnings.
Hence, reporting standards require firms to separate income and expense items which are likely to continue from items which are not likely to continue. A classic example of an item which is not likely to continue is discontinued operation. This is essentially an operation which a company has disposed or plans to dispose. Net income from a discontinued operation is shown net of tax after net income from continuing operation. Let's say we have a company X with a certain operation that it plans to discontinue at the end of the year. Obviously, there will be a certain income or loss associated with that operation and that income or loss will be part of the eventual net income. However, since this operation is being discontinued, the net income, and this is the income net of tax, is going to be reported after the income from the continuing operation. And this allows an analyst to easily determine what part of the income is likely to continue and what part of the income is not likely to continue in the future. Unusual or infrequent items, this term is also used in US GAAP and examples of items which are unusual or infrequent include restructuring charges, gains and losses from sale of equipment and so on. These items are highlighted as being unusual or infrequent but are still shown as operating expenses. Non-operating items. Non-operating items are typically reported separately from operating income because they are material and or relevant to the understanding of the company's financial performance. If you recall, we showed a very simple income statement earlier where there is revenue. Then we subtract various operating expenses such as sales, general and administrative expenses, depreciation expenses and so on. But then there might be certain expenses that are not part of the general operation of a company. Those are shown as non-operating. As an analyst, we are often concerned with the operating income. And companies have an incentive to show a relatively high operating income. So where possible, companies will try to identify certain items as non-operating and then show those items after the operating income. Under IFRS, there is no definition of operating activities. This does not mean that companies do not show an operating income or that companies do not show operating expenses. It simply means that companies need to use their discretion to determine which expenses are shown as operating expenses and which expenses are shown as non-operating expenses. Interest or dividend received, for example, would be an operating item for a financial services firm. Interest expense would be an operating item for a bank, but a non-operating item for a manufacturing firm. Generally, investing and financing activities are disclosed on a net basis. And what this means is, if you consider a manufacturing firm, which might be paying a certain amount of interest expense and maybe receiving some interest, then the net interest amount will be disclosed as a single line and the details will be shown in the footnotes. Here is a visual depiction of what we've been talking about and we will take the perspective of a manufacturing company which is reporting using US GAAP. The top line shows the revenue or income and here we need to be concerned about the revenue recognition rules. We talked about various revenue recognition criteria but I want to make sure you remember two core criteria. The first criteria is that goods or services have been delivered and the second core criteria is that cash has been received or there is reasonable certainty that cash will be received. 
with operating expenses we have these major operating expenses typically for a company the cost of goods sold sales general and administrative expenses depreciation which is a non cash expense but still considered a uh, operating expense and then in the us gap context we have a category called unusual or infrequent items which need to be shown as part of operating expenses here again we need to have expense recognition rules in mind when we show particular expenses in the income statement and we also need to have the matching principle in mind we subtract operating expenses and come up with operating income then we subtract non operating expenses for a manufacturing firm interest expense would be a classic non operating expense we subtract non operating expenses and come up with ebt this is earnings before tax for continuing operations then we subtract taxes and come up with net income from continuing operations earnings from discontinued operation net of taxes are then shown after net income from continuing operations and the details related to this can be found in the footnotes and finally we have net earnings or net income for the overall firm changes in accounting policies new standards might require companies to change accounting policies companies may be allowed to adopt standards either prospectively or retrospectively prospectively means that we need to report based on a given change moving forward retrospectively means that the impact of the accounting policy also needs to be shown in financial reports from the past changes in accounting principle require retrospective application so if a company is reporting inventory based on last in first out and now is reporting based on first in first out this is a change in accounting principle and would require retrospective application similarly if a company is using new revenue recognition rules then that would also require retrospective application the example in the curriculum is about a company using new revenue recognition rules and i hope you understand why we require retrospective application over here if you go back to the earlier reading on accounting standards one important characteristic is that of comparability obviously you want to be able to compare numbers expense numbers or revenue numbers from one period with the earlier periods and if we have a situation where in a earlier period we are using lifo and now we change to fifo that would mean that inventory related numbers on the balance sheet and income statement cannot be compared so we should restate financial reports from the past to use the same standard that we are using now or to use the same accounting principle that we are using now this would be consistent with the characteristic of comparability similarly revenue recognition rules if we want to compare revenue in our current period with revenue in earlier periods then we need to be recognizing revenue using the same rules changes in accounting estimates require prospective application so this means that we only need to worry about the current financial reports and the reports moving forward if we change the useful life of depreciable assets earlier we had estimated that the depreciable life is 10 years and now we reestimate the life to be down to 7 years this only requires us to make changes to accounting reports financial statements moving forward correction of an error for a prior period requires a restatement of the four major financial statements if a company is making corrections very often then that is a negative signal and analysts will generally avoid investing in companies which make frequent corrections